I was asked to talk a little bit about our work in the Congo. I'll do a, talk a little bit about um, the work there. Our, we are not the head of that work. We are, we've been asked to come join into that work uh, to help with the technology part of it. Uh, it was started by this family who are native Congolese. And they, Sebastian and Lillian, were both trained in the university to be, I think she was a teacher. He a, was a development worker. He was involved in development projects, uh, hydroelectric dams, and bigger projects like that before the war. It's, uh, a lot of people don't know about the Second Congo, Second African War, the Great African War, the Second Congo War uh, that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s when Basically, we had the biggest war in, in the world history since World War II. And no, most people don't realize that, at least Americans. Uh, it was a very big war. I forget how many countries were involved. Uh, was it 19 countries, maybe? Um, we all know about Rwanda and the genocide there. And that was part of this whole thing, this whole big war. The same thing happened in Congo, just on a much bigger scale, a much less reported situation. A little bit of good news coming out of Congo this week. They declared an end to the Ebola outbreak, the latest one. So that's a good, good thing. But where we work in Congo is so far removed from that area of Congo that we, we always, people there say, oh, Ebola, the roads are so bad, germs can't even travel. So, um, and there's some truth to that. There is some truth to that. There are areas of the country you can't get to from here. And, and that's kind of how it is where we work there. The, the nation of Congo is four times the size of Texas. So if you can imagine, that's a pretty big country. And it's mostly, a lot of it is jungle, deep jungle. Some of the very deepest jungles. Uh, some people report even dinosaur-like critters living out in those jungles. They're so far removed. I don't know how, how big of lizards they get, but they, they apparently have some. The, I don't know if you know the history of Congo at all, but back in the 18, I forget what decade of the 1800s it was, the powers of Europe got together and divided the continent of Africa up to decide who's going to get what. You know, we don't want to fight each other over the resources of Africa and have a bunch of wars between ourselves. So let's just get together and have a meeting, kind of like Pepsi and Coca-Cola, and decide who gets which country. Right? And that's kind of what Pepsi and Coke did back in the 1970s. You know, if you go to some countries, you have Coke. Some countries, you have Pepsi. Well, that's why. Well, the European governments did the same thing. So this country gets, France gets these places, and England will get these places, and, and even Spain got their little Equatorial Guinea and and uh, the Portuguese will get theirs and the Belgians got theirs and the Dutch got theirs and the Germans and you ended up with the division that we've had since then colonialism right well what was left over after the meeting was what nobody wanted and that was the Congo and King Leopold said of, of Belgium said I'll take it so it became the biggest personal farm in human history was the nation of Congo that became King Leopold's personal plantation. And from that, he, he created a lot, of, a lot of pain and suffering, enslaving the people there and extracting the minerals and the timber and things from parts of it. And actually became a big piece of the slave trade later on. So the people there have been unusually abused by Western civilization. They speak French as a national language, but only the educated speak French, you know, the, the ones that went to school and learned it there. I forget how many hundreds of tribes there are and hundreds and hundreds of different languages. And there's a new language every 40 feet or so, so it's about impossible to learn one. Uh, between the Bemba and the Tabwa, and, and the, it just goes on and on and on. So about every town you come to, you're speaking a different language. 
makes it very difficult to learn language. But they also have a common trade language of Swahili most of the time, um, especially since the war and people got moved around. So the long, that's kind of the history of the, the country. Uh, it was broken in half or broken two pieces, one part becoming more of a socialist communist country, one being a French speaking supposedly Catholic Christian country and um, a democratic country. Skip ahead one time. That family there is at Kowele and Kaimba or Sebastian and Lillian, their English names. Go ahead one more, Luke. So put the pointer on DRC. See the big one in the middle? All right, so has anybody heard of Joseph Kony? The guy from Uganda that killing his own people, the Lord's Resistance Army and all that, the child soldiers and things for almost 40 years. Uh, he was up in the north, up in that area. Rwanda's there on the right, down below Luke, low south. And then uh, the capital is way over on the left by the coast, which is, which is a whole continent away from anywhere and almost impossible to get there from any. <laughs> from where we work. So what we do is we fly into Zambia, which is way down here, capital of Zambia, travel over land through Zambia, around to the right, all the way up to the top there, and then cross over and try to find some way to get to where we're going, which is across the border in the Congo. It's extremely rugged, and of all the places I've been, it is by far the hardest travel trip I ever have made. It takes five days to get there from Atlanta, by the time you fly and drive and take a bus and walk and push the bus and you know <laughs> rebuild the bus and all that stuff. So, all right. So, <clears throat> before I get into our our work there, I want to talk a little bit about them. Um, they are a group of people from all up in this region. This is the border of Zambia and Congo. Back during the war, they, a lot of them fled the country and went into Zambia to escape the fight. Zambia's never had a war. They're a very stable country as African nations go. And they, they took in hundreds of thousands of refugees. And they, when Sebastian and his family tells a story, they, they crossed the border and they got put on a bus and said, you, you wanna go to a UN refugee camp? have anywhere else to go so put them on a bus and they were on the second bus and they drove up to this place in the woods and they they took them out and they said well this is your refugee camp and Sebastian said well it was just woods and um, they got out and they left all the women and children over here and the men went down in the woods to to get their assignments of, of plots of land and they were expecting you know just some kind of facilities of some kind and when they got there, there was four pins, you know, stakes driven in the ground, and a tarp and a rope, and said, "Well, here's your, here's your, your refugee camp. Build it." So um, the men all gathered together and cried for a while, and then they moved into their clearing their their jungle and building a refugee camp. And so <clears throat> Sebastian, being the leader that he is and the development guy that he is. They were there a little bit, not too long. They would get a little ration of oil and salt and rice and beans maybe, and, and it wasn't nearly enough to live well on. And he decided, this isn't gonna work, so we need to do better than this. So he organized a group of 11 or 12 guys, leaders, chiefs, and said, well, can't we do better? Can't we do, develop this place? If we, we can't work at home, why don't we just turn this into a decent place to live instead of living like animals in a cage? Let's, let's fix this up. So they he pulled everybody together and they started basically a development project right there in the woods in the refugee camp. They started an education program for the children, keep them going and out of trouble. They built sanitation projects. They, everybody pulled all their seeds and garden tools and they started growing their own food. They had I think they had even some security teams that would keep an eye on things. They built housing, they built, you know, they just built 
basically built a small village in the refugee camp. And then the leader of the UN, Kofi Annan, at the time, came there and visited and called it, at that time, the best refugee camp in the world. Amongst their visions and dreams was, well, what are we going to do when we go home? How, you know, that's, I mean, you imagine if you got run away from your home during a war. Now, what are we going to do when we go back? Somebody's going to have our home, our farm, our place, our business, our stuff. What are we going to do? Are we going to go back and fight for it? Are we going to go kick them out? Are we going to go start another fight? And so Sebastian's idea was, I'll tell you what, why don't we, instead of doing that, we're working well together here as a community, why don't we just leave here and go find a new place back home where nobody lives, forget the past, forgive and forget, let it go, and start over. And that was kind of his vision and dream. <clears throat> As is the case with most governmental authorities, um, they don't make a lot of sense most of the time in what they do. And I don't want to bad talk uh, the powers that be, but it seems like the United Nations goal when they have a refugee camp is to empty the refugee camp. That's their goal. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but the way that they can empty a refugee camp is to find places for the best and brightest to leave and get visas to go to different countries around the world. So if they have some college educated people, they can get them a visa to go to the United States. Or if they have somebody who has some influence over here or over there, they can find a way to get them, some of them shipped off so they can kind of empty out the numbers. So since Sebastian and them were very good at what they do, they decided they didn't want them to do it anymore, I guess. And they got them a visa to move and immigrate to the United States. So they put them on a plane and mailed them to Mobile, Alabama. Now, that's funny that you said that because when Sebastian got his paperwork, he said, his wife asked him, well, where are we going? I don't know. It says Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> and... Um, and they came to Mobile, and they, they now live in a place called Eclectic, Alabama, which is not far from Montgomery. <clears throat> and they've been back and forth um, ever since. It it's, has been working for them to become U.S. citizens and use that legal status to be able to travel more freely than they would as Congolese. So it has helped uh, with that. So what happened? They moved here. Refugees stayed in the camp, continued on with the work and the organization they started there. And then um, Sebastian's came here and worked just kind of regular jobs. I think he was putting in marble countertops and working at the grocery store and doing that kind of thing. And one day the phone rings and it's the head of the United Nations Relocation Department, whatever they call that saying, I hear you have a plan for a nonviolent solution to reintegration. Some big fancy sounding terminology. And he didn't know what they were talking about at first. And finally he realized, he's talking about my idea about not going back to the old place. So they, they, he told them what his idea was and they liked it. So they took it to the government of Zambia and the government of Congo and the United Nations and the US and, and they Everybody was in favor. They came back and said, well, if you will find the land that you can use for this, we'll support the project. We'll, we'll get behind it. So he had several chiefs in the camp already that they didn't know about, land chiefs, and was able to get the land just by talking to them. And they agreed. And so they started an organization called P&E in French, stands for Peace and Hope is the name of it. And its purpose in the beginning was to develop themselves there in the camp. And then the second phase was to go and prepare for and then build a, a city, a town. That was the project of this organization. So all the members were the people who lived there. There are now something like 10 or 12,000 people in that town. Not all of whom now are members. And then the third phase is what they're working on now, which is, they call it Ichande. They got a, a big land grant 
and they're trying to build a training facility and a model village and, and some other development projects out there. So, Luke, you want to show? Where are we? Where's the border? Okay. So, yeah, normally this is a town called Caputa. And I assure you, everything there is kaput. <laughs> um, this last trip, while we were en route, they closed the border. There, uh, one of the political issues having to do with colonialism is that when Westerners go and divide up lands, they divide up tribes. And they'll draw borders that are convenient to them, but don't make any sense to the people who live there. So all of these people in Zambia and all of these people in Congo are all Tabwa. They are loyal to their tribe and they, they have traditionally always farmed on the Congolese side where the soil is better and lived down south by the lake where they have access to the water. It, it's just how they've always done it. So now you have this border that's been established by outsiders and so that's causing a lot of strife there between them. So because of some of that strife, some of the, the soldiers in the area on the Congo side and the native, the locals rather, leadership, and really just a bunch of juvenile delinquents, to be honest, uh, were beating outsiders and they raped some women and they, they were take, you know, doing some bad stuff. So they closed the border, the Zambians closed the border and wouldn't let anybody across which means basically that nobody can cross officially, which means everybody can cross except the white guy that's going to be noticed by everybody when he does. So we got to Caputa and got stuck there for several weeks this last trip and just sat there and waited and waited and waited. And finally, we went by another way and figured out we could go another way. We went all the way to the lake, crossed the border in a different state, and then traveled cross country through the woods 90 miles back to our destination. Instead of driving there, we, well, we actually took motorbikes through the woods. And we've got some of the video on that, so you want to go play the next one? Yeah, that's the town. You can see that area right there. That's the, the village they built. And that village is called Fube, F U B E. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just a sign there at the entrance to go ahead. A better picture of it. And it's built like a road compass. They haven't completely finished out the entire road compass, but you can see right here the mm -hmm. the little points on the compass. So that's the village and then the new land that they've been given is from that ridge, all that other side, yeah, it's, it's the size of an Alabama county. Um, go ahead. And this south side land here is their farm plots. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is Caputa, and that's a really good picture of what everything in Caputa is like. <laughs> that's about how it works, except that picture was taken in 2018. In 2019, the front tires flat too. Um, Luke was telling a story about taking pictures. Let it play, Luke. Of taking pictures of a bus. I think this might be it. Well, that's the the state of, of the buses. One thing we're wanting to work with is uh, developing clay roof tiles and be able to fire clay roof tiles instead of having thatch roofing, because traditionally, back it up one. Traditionally. They use thatch, but thatch requires a huge amount of burning. They have to burn acres and acres and acres of wood of grasslands to make the thatch every year. And it's very detrimental to wildlife. And they're trying to re repopulate the wildlife so they have something to hunt and something to eat. And so we're working, working toward having clay roof tiles instead of thatch roofing. Go ahead. This is my wife, Erica. This was 2018. We were there taking a picture. We have a local magazine. We can get some free advertisement for the organization if we
take the magazine somewhere and take a picture of it. So we, we're on the border of Zambia and Congo there. There you go. That is a perfect picture of the emergency animal disease control unit. <laughs> that is a state of emergency response in, uh, in northern Zambia right there. <laughs> So the typical uh, African well water source, this, um, the typical motorcycle helmet, I think that was Luke's head, right? Uh, typical store, uh, somebody can afford to buy a full bottle of something, stop. Uh, they'll sell it off in little baggies full of oil or salt or something in little tiny amounts, make a few cents. This is a place in northern Zambia where they're making salt from the dirt. They're extracting salt from this lake bed that's out behind there, all grown up in reeds. They dig up that mud, and they burn the reeds, and they mix them together, and then they run water through it, and out comes a salt of some kind that's marketable. Um, it actually made me sick, so I, I don't know what's in it. <laughs> Maybe it's got lead in it. I don't know. Um, but they, they just run it through, and then they boil the water off. I thought it was really interesting. We could do a lot of good there with some of our technology, I think. Some of the poorest people that I saw in Zambia, actually. Let it run. There's a homemade welder in Zambia. Go ahead. I thought that was pretty neat. Unfortunately, he's welding with sunglasses and probably won't be able to see. Now, this is the, one of the bigger problems with Africa right now, and that is the nation of China. Uh, China is invading Africa all over the place and extracting minerals and resources on a massive scale, um, incomparable certainly to what the United States and Canada and the West and the Europe has done in the past. Back up. That, that shed there is built in the communities that vote for the Chinese-backed leader. And so they'll come and they'll build a, in this case, a grain mill and a, and a seed separator and a big elaborate machines, a charging station and uh, woodworking shops and stuff like that. And so African 1980s era well, there are tens of thousands of wells that were drilled in, back in the, through the 80s and 90s in Africa that are not used because the pumps went bad and they weren't maintained. And so there are entire organizations now whose objective it is simply to go back and try to get people trained and taking care of their own pump for their well. And this is in northern, Zam northern Zambia. Brand new equipment. It's been sitting there for about eight years or so. Never been used. They're afraid it might get scratched if they use it. So it sits at the ministry, the government ministry offices. It's supposed to be used as a kind of a corporate communal type thing, and it doesn't get used. So, back up one. Like I said, we sat in that, that village for two weeks waiting, and finally we figured out that if we were way off to the west, to the far side of the country by the lake over here, there's a little piece of that state that had the border open, and if we would cross there at the lake, just right there at the corner, then we could travel across country to get to our destination. So we decided to do that. Problem is we had 5,700 pounds of cargo with us. We had taken a lot from here. We had bought a lot in the capital city of Zambia. And they had, they had everything. They had mattresses. I had taken a sawmill and a big chainsaw. We had 30 or 40 gallons of gasoline. They had I don't know how many cases of ceramic tile for the church, for their community church house, window glass, I mean, you, clothing, you name it. They were hauling a bunch of stuff in. And normally we'd have a truck and we'd, we'd hire a truck from Zambia to drive us up there. And it would be a really bad ride. But this time we didn't have that. So in order to overcome that, play it. The decision was made that the organization would ride their bicycles to meet us at the border. So they rode bicycles 90 miles to meet us at the border, and this is them where we met them. 
And then they would load that 5,700 pounds of cargo on 60 bicycles and push it back the 90 miles over the mountains. So they made a meal of Ugali while they were there. Anybody had that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's not grits, though. It's not Alabama grits. Um, these are tw six meter long, three inch square tubing that we took for the Alaska sawmill. And here's some of the trail. This is some of the better part of the road. Um, just let it play. I don't know. Anyway, 90 miles of this. Well, actually, it gets dark before too long, and uh, we were in the dark for most of it. But. <clears throat> and they're actually trying to hold the camera still. <laughs> yeah, that's my daughter with me. Luke was riding with another, and then and then Lillian, who was with us, uh, was riding on a third bike. So I can't, felt kind of guilty. Here we are crossing the border. Uh, there's my daughter, Naomi. This is the immigration office. We were the only uh, non-Zambian, non-Congolese ever to pass through this immigration office. We were the first, first outsiders, certainly the first white people. Uh, we were we were in this. <laughs> this is a funny story. Um, we were in this this little hut. It's only about this tall, and we've been riding for four or five hours. And Luke, he's got off and he's stretching. His back's hurting, but we have to go in and sit in front of the officer. And we're sitting on this little bench. It's about about as tall as this step. And so he's sitting there, and then he needs to stretch his back. So he rolls off the bench onto his knees, and so. He, ends up, he's kneeling in front of this immigration officer. And the woman outside the door starts screaming, nah, 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 and running all the children away. And, and Lillian uh, Kaimba, who was with us, who understood enough Bimba to say, no, no, it's not that. He's just, he's just stretching his back. Get off your knees. She thinks you're worshiping this guy. Um, so be careful. Uh, but she caught it and was able to, to get it under control before it became a bad thing. Go ahead. This is the border. The actual border. Crossing the Zambia. You okay? Yeah, this, on this particular trip, we went to places that we, we, we were the only outsiders, certainly the only white people they'd ever seen. And so there was a lot of, a little, a lot of pressure actually on trying to be a really good example and making sure we don't do or say or act in a way that was uh, detrimental in any way. Because we, we literally had children, people just would run away, thought we were ghosts thought we were some really strange thing. And certainly since the war, there have not been any people like that there. So you have you know, 20 years or so of people that have been born since then that don't know um, about outsiders much. So this one, some of them started arriving. This fella pushed the mattresses 90 miles back. Go ahead, play it. We got a long way to go. And here's Luke helping the Young man who pushed the steel poles. And here's where the rest of them. It took them 60 hours to get back that 90 miles with all that stuff. I show that just to, to show 
these people are, are a very glaring exception to the stereotype that poor people are lazy. Most of the time, in my experience, they're not, unless they've been contaminated with, with the welfare problem. Um, these people, this is in t double speed, I think, but um, <laughs> but they just keep coming. Do what? I wanted to believe that thing. Oh. <laughs> Well, go for a hike with them. Luke will tell you they'll walk you to death. Um, they have enormous stamina. I mean, just unbelievable stamina. And they just keep coming. All right. Uh-huh. Yeah, we were pretty impressed with this bunch this time. They, they, they are something else. And so what they have, they all, all live in town, and they're trying to rebuild, pause, they're trying to rebuild or build another place kind of outside of town to get out of some of the local politics and to be a little bit more out of the middle of the village, the big city part and to be able to do more of their own sustainable farming and things out there. Um, the property that we're standing on a hill, it's about a third again as much behind us as there is in front of us, and it goes over to that far ridge over there. Go ahead. You gotta get through this. Yeah, it's a pretty big place. So they asked, when they got this, they asked us to come look at what we have and help us to figure out what we can do with what we have so that we can develop things. This is where they sleep, uh, um, out here on these mats under the mosquito nets. They're putting up this roof. They're gardening. This is the end of the dry season, so that's rather impressive for that time of year. They do a lot of nutrition programs and trying to get more vitamins into the diet and irrigation fish, up, project. fish project now since last year. <clears throat> Watch this thing speed up. They feed their fish termites. They have a lot of local native termite mounds and they just go harvest them and feed them to the fish. So the termites eat everything but they, they use them. Everybody in the organization is assigned to a group. So there's the road department who builds roads, uh, primarily. There's a construction crew who builds, builds buildings and things. This is the prayer room. They, there's the garden groups, the, all the different things that they do. They, they each have groups. Here we're making some fuel efficient cook stoves. I was really encouraged. We, we taught these in 2018. We went, my wife is teaching solar cooking here. Went back in 2019 and they were taking care of them and using them and built a shed over them. And, this shed actually. Yeah, right there. And they wanted a bigger one, so we built a bigger one. The tip tap hand washing stations, um, solar cooking. We got a, we took a, a projector a small projector and a computer this year and Jesse made a bunch of training videos that we we used for training this we were actually canned some salsa while we were there and made a video and we were going to open it next time we go to try to show the the whole concept of canning you can put it up now and eat it a year or two later um, I forgot what I was going to say about that hmm? go Lay it on. Yeah, Kaimba was doing a class here. She asked him, well, build a fire that represents your zeal for overcoming your, your problems and, and, and being a light in the world and living a better life. And so they, they built this fire to represent that. 
And then she had some people come along that were, that were going to, she was trying to teach an object lesson. And she had Luke and some others come and pour water on their fire. And that was supposed to represent uh, to them the people that they're listening to that keep telling them that you can't do anything. That we're always going to be poor and you're wasting your time and you shouldn't be involved in this group. You should stay away. So that, those people represented the water that got thrown on their fire. So what are you going to do? And, and she was trying to get them to chase them away and tell them to leave them alone. Play it. Yeah, we had a couple of things happen this last time. We had the, we went and visited the, the land chief that donated the land. He's about to die <clears throat> from cancer, we believe. And he, he had a chance to sell off the logs to the Chinese logging company, but he chose to give it to the nonprofit organization there to try to protect it. He said his grandchildren would never forgive him if he sold out and became a millionaire and moved to Europe and whatever and lived a nice comfortable life. So he lives in a little mud shack instead to preserve his heritage for his ancestors or his, his uh, children and grandchildren. Then we had the, the groupment chief come, which they have many layers of chiefs. So uh, the groupment chief came to investigate. And he was very nervous because he'd never really sat down and talked to white people. And he was very nervous about that. And, but So we had a table set out of some of the things we were teaching while we were there. So we just kind of, um, some of Naomi's crochet products that she was teaching. Well, some of the, yeah, some of her students made some of these. Uh, we were teaching nutrition classes, some of Luke's beekeeping stuff. I was teaching auto mechanics. We had a truck there we were working on, so I have a class of that. And the cups were some of the, <clears throat> clay that we harvested there before and we brought it home and I had a potter friend of mine in Alabama spin it and throw it and make some cups out of it and uh, fire them so we could kind of give an idea of what's possible with the, the clay that they have there. That was exciting. This is Kasongo. Every board they have, this is how they make it. And that is, that's their sawmill. Um, So here, he's chopping up a tree with an axe. I should have brought my axe. They gave me one of these axes. The guy at the airport thought was interesting. <laughs> How'd you get the soil back in here to fire? That's illegal. I put it in my suitcase, and here it came. They searched my, they put a paper in my bag saying they'd searched my bag, but it was in there with a bunch of dried bugs grub worms or something that I was bringing back for another class. And um, the is to hide in your dirty underwear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this time, Sebastian Lillian's church men's group there had raised money for a, a mill project. They have plans to build, I think it's 89 houses this year. And so they wanted to make certain pieces of the lumber. So they raised money and I bought all the stuff and that was us roll, them untangling five or a hundred feet of chainsaw chain. And we had a lot of classes on chainsaw, safety, maintenance, use, milling, um, had a crew. They have a very elaborate uh, committee system where usually the older mamas are in charge of making sure everything's where it needs to be and you have certain ones who are in charge of operations and certain ones in charge of different pieces. So one thing I learned was that, keep playing, one thing I learned was that their upper body strength, while they have so much stamina, they can outwork me for days, but they don't have enough upper body strength to run that big saw. And so, yeah, there we were with a broken mill and no machine shop to fix it. So uh, we had to improvise. No, it's very loud. So we found out really the only people we could get trained easily to run a chainsaw were the motorcycle drivers. They have enough, to, similar enough that they could figure it out. So here they are making, making boards. 
Not my favorite way to make lumber. Uh, it's not real cheap. It costs a lot of fuel, so we're hoping to use the sawdust or the slab wood to fire a gasifier to run a bandsaw at some point is kind of the hope. All right. Play that. Yeah, here they are coming home with a load of wood. Skip ahead. They have the truck there. It's the only truck in the region. It's been broken down for five years or so. And we were able a year and a or year and a half ago to kind of diagnose it and take parts with us this time. And I taught some classes on fixing it. They actually got it done a lot faster than I expected. When you go there and you say, okay, who wants to be on the, in the mechanic, auto mechanics class? And 90 hands go up in here. Okay, who wants to be in, in the pottery class? 90, who wants to be a beekeeper? 70 hands go up. And um, play it. We got to go. Let it run. Yeah, they had to put a clutch in. We were talking earlier, or last night we were talking about, I think, um, connecting with the people and being, being accepted by them. Maybe some today, too. And here they are. Um, here we are on a test drive going to town. Um, but they, <clears throat> we're talking about connecting with the people and breaking the ice. We're talking about uh, teaching uh, using language, asking them to teach you language as an, a way of, to do that. And that's a, a really good, good thing. One thing in this group, being who we are and coming to them the way we are, we're, we're a guest in such a way that it makes it impossible for us to, it would be an offense to them if we acted like we were at their level, like we would normally do in most situations. It's impossible. And so we were struggling to find a way to break that ice and kind of overcome. <laughs> His guy's name is Believer. He's, he's really funny. He's scared of bees. Um, and so we were struggling, struggling. How do, we, how do we break this ice? This is the tree where we got stoned um, from the... <laughs> yeah. So, my, what I was getting at is breaking the ice there and, and being accepted by them. The one thing we found that we could do was just to sit down in the dirt with them. They sit on the ground, and we sat on the ground. And when we did that, the first time I did that, I remember there was this, this oh, really? They're sitting on it. What? There was all this excitement around. Another time I was teaching how to build a stove, first time we were there. And when I reached down and put my hands in the mud, stop it, back it up. For, I put my hands down in the mud for the first time and I heard all these voices in the background that I didn't understand the language, but I could hear the, the excitement in the air just go up because, wow, he's put his hands in the mud. Can you believe, you know, that was just unbelievable that we do that. So very simple things that actually spoke very loudly to them. Are you going to play that? So we went to a termite mound. And then we dug about six inches below the ground. And we got recovered all of these combs. Not a single drop of honey in any of them. A little bit of pollen and a good deal of brood. We had a bee that followed us home. <laughs> and I got a few, well, quite a few bees in here. Put them in alcohol and take them home. 
So we brought the bees home. We're hoping to have them genetically tested at Auburn or some university so we can track, figure out what exactly kind of bees we're dealing with so we can know what to work, what we're working with. Here's Naomi's crochet class. You need to keep it playing, Luke, please. Because we've got to move through it. These are some of their products before we left. This little girl on the ground can't walk. And this woman learned how to do it without a crochet hook. She just decided she was going to join the class and got herself a stick and started. And so she just, just started making a hat. So we took a lot of yarn and stuff. There's a set of clothes they made. Like I said, lots of burning everywhere. There are pygmies that live on, tribes of pygmies that live on the land, and they are hunter-gatherers, and their primary hunting tool is fire. So they just light one side of the woods on fire and stand on the other side and, and beat everything that comes through with a stick or shoot it. Um, here they're planting trees to make salt, an orchard of trees. And I got in real trouble about this picture because I was using an ax, which is the one thing the doctor said I wasn't supposed to do after my surgery. My wife wasn't really happy about that. Um, this is a bunker they built <laughs> to store the chainsaw in. And uh, <laughs> I taught a class here. That's some of them. Okay, here is Naomi. And I, we were talking about that, that idea of how do you overcome, how do you break down that, that, uh, that sense of inferiority or whatever. And we, so we were doing this. It was kind of a makeshift thing. It came up the day before. Pause it. And uh, we did it just kind of as a joke one day. And then we figured out, well, we could use this. And they were having a, a sending off party for us the next day and cooking a goat. And, and so we, we uh, they got a little dressed up for it and, and made a plan and it worked out really well as kind of a sociology class and it, and it worked really well. So, Luke, play it. And Naomi has a pretty good British accent, so she had to use that. I don't care if you didn't close the door. I don't care if it burns down. I want water in a poop of glass cup. Now. Turned up. <laughs> Naomi had a really hard time doing this because she felt guilty. Was that all of it? Oh, okay. So it went on for quite a while, and um, the people really saw through it. Back it up. They really saw through it and understood what we're trying to get at, and 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 realized this is exactly what we've been doing and been treated this way and that's why we feel the way we do ab about ourselves and why we're not seeing ourselves and that several of them got up and preached messages after that about that very thing that you know we're we're allowing this treatment of us through history to hinder our our view of ourselves before God and it was a really powerful thing i you got to be careful <laughs> i taught a class and we showed a video on a root cellar that we had at home on campus and talked about storing vegetables in cooler environments. And before I knew it, they were building a root cellar inside their storage shed. So they just went to it. Go ahead. Um, I kind of wish they'd asked me a little more about it, but I couldn't hinder them. On Sundays, pause it. On Sundays, the school children would be out from, to the camp from town and they asked me to teach things like, I taught some geography classes and science classes. And here we're teaching some physics. And the men, I noticed when they move a log, they work like, you know, brute force moving the log, just really working really hard. And so I thought, well, maybe I can teach them how to use a fulcrum and roll the log up on a center point and just turn it where you want it to go instead of working so hard. So I taught the children how to do this so that they could turn this log, which is a lot heavier than it looks, uh, 
one person could turn, one little child could turn this log and aim it in any direction, and then they could roll it where they wanted to go. And so after we taught that, they, they got really excited and said, now we're going to go teach the men how to do this. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, but it worked out pretty well. Go ahead. This young man heard, a, I taught a class one week on uh, vacuum and steam and the condensation of steam. And he came back the next week with a little model he'd made out of some tin cans and rubber hose and, and had a working pump. It was really exciting, really smart. This is a rat trap that saved us when we got in trouble with the soldiers. Go ahead. Here I'm making a little sawdust cooker. Since they have saw now, they have sawdust, and so now they can make a cooker burning the sawdust as fuel out of a piece of metal. Here we are making one out of some bricks. And again, using the wrong sawdust from the tree that doesn't burn. Um, first time I went there, I taught rocket stoves, and I'm trying to light a fire, and there's a big crowd of people, and I'm getting embarrassed because it's not, let it play, because it's not, it's not burning. It'll burn for a minute and quit, and, and finally, one of the women said, well, that's the wood that doesn't burn. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Um, <laughs> go get some other wood. Uh, so Luke went on an expedition to the other side of the land to check out this waterfall and see if it's useful for power production, a water wheel or something. And they don't swim there. And so when he jumped in the, la in the water, he scared them and thought they were going to be in big trouble for losing the white guy they were in, in, entrusted with. Um, everything is burnt because, like I said, I'm trying to stop the burning. This is a pygmy village they found when they went through. Okay. Need to finish. Honey. This is the land chief. So this is where he lives instead of off in Europe where he could be. Well, I'm really impressed with, with him. It's the groupman chief. <laughs> he came to visit and check everything out. And here are the soldiers. So we, the last day we were there this past time, we, that guy right in the middle is the immigration officer at the border we normally cross. And he had already expected he was going to make his $100 for his bribe as we crossed the border with our stuff, you know, his the import duties, they call them. And since we couldn't go through that checkpoint, we had to go around, we didn't pay him. And so that created some, some issues. So he stirred up all these other, there's a congressman there and a, some immigration officer leader and several army officers and soldiers. And they, they came to town and were in the area and this guy stirred them up against us basically, and some of the other people in town that didn't like the, the project and some of their enemies, and convinced these officials that there were four Americans out here at this place exploiting the locals and mining gold, using them for slave labor. So that's their mentality. And they, so they jumped in their Jeep next day, and they zipped up the driveway and it was unusual because there's only been three or four vehicles on that driveway ever, and I've been in most of them. And here they came, and they came fast, and they came right up in front of our house where we sleep there, and and they jumped out and with their guns. And I, you know, I was in the army. I know army tactics, and they're they're obviously looking for something. And common sense says it was us. And so we. I forget exactly how but we were all, me and Luke and Naomi were in my room packing, getting ready to go home. And I grew up hearing all these stories about soldiers coming and invading and taking hostages and stuff. And boy, at that moment, boy, I was right here. What am I going to do? You know, am I going to fight? I got my daughter here, 14-year-old daughter, 13-year-old daughter. Um, what am I going to do? And I was faced with that whole question. It's very real at the moment. And when they looked, they saw me through the window, the, the, the major, 
there, the one in command of the soldiers, and, and he issued some orders, and they all surrounded our house, and it was very obvious that they were there looking for us. And so I sent Luke out. He was already on his way out. He, I went, he went on to go take um, a message to Kaimba to come translate and deal with this situation. And one of the soldiers, you know, threw his gun up on Luke. And I didn't, I was kind of worried he was going to shoot at him because he thought he was escaping. And one of the members there, believer in the back, ran out and said, no, 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 he's not trying to escape. And I went out and dropped on my knees right in the middle of all of them with my hands up so that they would turn their attention on me. And um, it all eventually... Long story short, it all kind of worked out, and we showed him what we were doing there and showed him our rat traps and our, our pottery and our, our crochet and, and different things and told him why we were there. And after how many hours of interrogation? Three or four hours. We finally made peace with them and made friends out of them and didn't get shot. So that was good. And uh, then... Then came home. I guess that's probably close to the end. Go ahead. Oh, Luke had malaria too, so yeah, he wasn't paying attention. Go ahead, play it. So the project there, they work in agriculture and all kind of health development and and different uh, reforestation and and lumber production and. Um, food production, the, the list is endless what they're, they're working on, and they're doing a very good job. COVID has been very detrimental to all of it, not because of the sickness, but because of the politics. The they government and the officials are using it as a, a handle to get a hold of the people and have more control, and so they're, they're using it against them. We actually went out a different way this time. We went across the lake and down a ferry for a day. And um, these boys sailed over from Tanzania or Tanzania to, to sell some things on the boat. But, and the, the boat smelled like fish because they had drying minnows there. But I think that's about it, Luke.